the block becomes your world in a way. I don't think the block's any different than life in general. There are people that you connect with, and there are people that you don't want to connect with. This is a unique place. It goes through phases. Every block has a little bit of different a life of its own. It's more than a house. We had, a, we had an amazing life there. It's a crapshoot. You don't really research who your neighbor It could be a mass murder next week. Well, you know? how would you know? The person wouldn't say, oh, by the way, I've murdered a few people, you know. <laughs> well, I think we can count on each other, which is a very important thing. That's how I feel about living on this block. I know if I needed help with anything and I went knocking on someone's door, they'd be there for me. Right away, I kind of feel like, well, this is really special. I almost feel privileged to be living here in this town, you know? I've been around the block a lot of times, and I've been around a lot of blocks. I was not born on this block. My family came here in 1965. That makes me, in a sense, a second generation, if you will. Every block has a little bit of different a life of its own, you know? You know, something that was just supposed to be like a five minute high turned into Bloody Mary's beach chair sitting outside and, and like two hours going by and we're like, okay, the day's pretty much, it's almost lunch. <laughs> but it's like a little oasis in the middle of New York City. Well, it was the best kept secret in town. I mean, a block is an amalgamation of human beings. And any time you throw a, a bunch of human beings into a pot, you're going to get a, you know, a unique and, fun, and hopefully funny mix. It's a crapshoot. You, you, we didn't, you know, like vet who the people were on the block. I had no clue. If something happened and I needed to go, I would not. There are a f number of people. There's some people I don't know at all that I would have no qualms going into and saying I need help. We found a neighborhood again. This is where our kids grew up. They were three, four, and five when they moved here. This is how they grew up. It's home. It's our home. It's our... Everybody is so nice. I was born in Rockway in 1957. I've lived here for about 25. I think that's just life in general. Um, I don't think the block's any different than life in general. There are people that you connect with, and there are people that you don't want to connect with. There is always going to be a rift in any community, any block, anywhere in the world, whether it's here or around the world. Yeah, she's very friendly with everybody. She's a very friendly, warm-hearted person. I'm not so much. So there are people on the block I just don't talk to at all. There's something here. You know, it's like it takes a village. It, it takes a block. As soon as we came down a dead end street and no cars by the curbs and basketball nets and hockey nets up by the curbs, I said, this is, a, this is a street like when I was a kid growing up. We had to, we had to stop and hold the, hold the game off for a second for the car to pass. I knew this was like, this was, would have been a haven for my kids, you know, because my son was into sports. The interesting thing, I think, was that we didn't meet anybody on the block right away. We met the children because we had a, a two-year-old and a newborn. And there were kids on the block who were very interested in the fact, oh my God, there are going to be, you know, more kids on the block. Oh, the new kids on the block, that's it. That's oh. <laughs> making friends or not making friends doesn't mean that there has to be hostility or disagreement. Whereas with other people, without any preconceived um, game plan or objectives, you just wind up having uh, a more convivial relationship. If you asked me back in 1974 how the neighborhood would be in 2022 currently, I would say it would change radically. It's such a large amount of time. But the neighborhood, to my surprise and happiness, is really stable and just as nice as it was when we moved in. Uh, back uh, when I was growing up out here, uh 
on any given summer night, everybody was sitting out in front of their houses on the front stoop or in a beach chair in front of the house or 10, 15 people would congregate in front of somebody's house, very frequently uh, our house. And it was great community. Everybody on the street knew each other and uh, I hope it's still that way. Then I think back in the 70s and 60s, people were just, they had to depend on each other more. They, you know, think of the phones. I remember our house, there was like four party lines where you shared the phone with four different neighbors, you know. Back, at when it, back in the 1960s, my parents had their, shared the phone with two or three other neighbors. I think from the get-go, we saw this as our village. This block was our village, our place to make friends, make, uh, make the best of it. And I think we've been very, very happy here. You know, we brought up two children, we have grandchildren. It, was, it, felt, it felt like home, like it felt like a big family. So I always felt very safe here. On my block, everybody knows who everybody is and they know not to push anybody's button. So that's why we are cool. Everybody know how to keep their cool. And that's the cool thing about the block. You know how to keep your cool. Uh, the kids used to laugh. They used to tell a story that like when I was very, very little, like I don't know how old. It's a memory that I don't particularly have, but the kids who were older than me have, is that apparently I heard the bells of the ice cream truck and I ran out of the house naked. <laughs> so I don't know if I was three or whatever it was. Oh, they would tell that story like, um, <laughs> You know, you know, he was the kid who ran out naked, you know, because he heard the bells of the ice cream truck. I know if I needed help with anything and I went knocking on someone's door, they'd be there for me, even if I'm not close with them. And that's a very important thing because I no longer have family here in New York. So this block is like an extended family for me. I have two cats in the house. If I want to go somewhere, I need to depend on one of my neighbors to help me with the cat so I can go away. And in return, I shouldn't say in return because they know I'm here and I help everybody that approaches me also, which I don't think that exists everywhere. And I think we have a very good block here because everybody is here for everyone. Even if there might be something about me that they don't like, they're still there to help me. And that's what family is. I mean, we d we're not happy with everything that everybody in our family does, mm -hmm. but it's family. I'm driving you to Derek's to get your car, no, so that we could drive to Brooklyn. I'm going to leave this car here in Brooklyn. At 120 seconds, you can't jump the curb with this car. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it's interesting that you it becomes much more important to you than you think it would be, and yet you don't really research who your neighbor would be. It could be a mass murderer next door to you. Well, you how know? would you know? The person wouldn't say, oh, by the way, I've murdered a few people, you know. <laughs> That's the point. I, I, people like to fence off to show their border where they live. To me, the fence or no fence, I don't need a fence. To live because again like I said we had houses upstate there were no fences you, it was all open land yesterday I made escrow and beans so I shared it with whoever was interested in soup on a hot day That's enjoy so your zucchini flowers <laughs> we got one more delivery I don't see her car but if she's home She'll get them. When you deal, look, I, I'm, I'm, I've been around the block a lot of times, and I've been around a lot of blocks. So like you see this today, you know, uh, if you're a certain culture, you're a certain color, you're a certain religion or something, people already have some kind of notion before they even meet you, you know? So that's just a reality in life. It's, any, it's like anything else. There are some people on the block you can talk to, some you can't, and some people I don't really know. People right next door, um, very nice lady, the husband. Say hello to him, it's like he kind of ignores you. Okay, knock yourself out, bro. I didn't take a bite of your sandwich, but it's okay. <laughs> Decorating the house with all these plastic flowers because I needed vivid colors. Colors make you happy. The right color in the right place, it can do wonders.
And that's what I, that's what I did. So if you look at the flowers, what Dr. Tito does is affect the different reactivating systems in your brain. The colors stimulate different areas of happiness. So um, good fences, I guess, are important. But I think fences need to have gates and doors to mm -hmm. allow people to pass through. Um, to be completely isolated um, does not engender a warm spirit, certainly does not engender friendliness or happiness. So I think it's good to have good fences with open doors as well. In other words, there are certain people who just, if they see something a certain way, that's just the way it is. And it doesn't matter, like if I came over to them and started having a conversation, started talking, or wanted to open up uh, something new about, uh, hey, what do you think about, you know, they're so locked in either to their own way of thinking or how they perceive you. Mm -hmm. And what I've noticed is that there were certain people, there are people in any community, of course, but there were a lot of people even on this block who, you know, they do what they call chirping a little bit. There's a little bit of this chirping and gossip and stuff. And if they have an idea, it's very hard to uh, dispel them of that notion or that idea. I can tell you one thing. I don't care what anybody thinks about me. You know why? I know what I know about me. Plain and simple. Then I butter my bread. Next, who cares? One thing, everybody knows each other's pants size, but other than that... <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is that everybody gets involved in people's business when they shouldn't. I believe very much about good fences. Yeah. This is my property, leave me alone. I don't want to get involved in your business. I wonder if they're going to see this movie. They're going to say, oh, that Dino. <laughs> well, I think appropriate distance, psychological distance is important. Uh, and particularly when there is no physical distance. When you live near to somebody, there's a temptation, I think, to mistake propinquity for intimacy, in other words. Because I live across uh, the street, the, the uh, driveway from this guy, there can be a temptation, and I've seen this happen with people. It can be a temptation to say whatever you want, do whatever you want, to assume that you're psychologically close as well as physiologically close. Everybody needs their own space. Uh, you need your own space. Uh, if you want to invite somebody into your space, that's fine. But I don't think people should necessarily push in uninvited. So if you have a fence, they have to come around to the gate or knock or whatever. Uh, same with a hedge. You know, you're not going to jump over a hedge. You know, there are some people you don't necessarily want all your business known to. Right. And that's fine doesn't mean you can't be friendly and get along with them. That's, mm. That has nothing to do with that. As I said earlier, people are here for you. And I mean, when we moved here, there was another family, the Raiders, that had young children. And it was great having them yeah, play our kids with grew each up together. other. And to they're still day, friends. They're friends. I mean, one of my children went to college with one of theirs. It's just an extension of what would be a family. At one point, we moved out to Long Island, where it, it was it was real nice. The house was everything was big, but it wasn't like a family out there. It just you knew your neighbor, and that was it. Here, people seem to be more family orientated with each other. Many of American personalities are: we want control, but a part of us doesn't want control. So, in other words, at a block party, you're still under control. Under control. But if someone can just walk into your house and sit down and say, I'll have a cup of tea, you're no longer in control. <laughs> right, right, right. And there's, there's an element of, all, of that in all of us. You'd always have, uh, the, you know, when we were younger, it was, don't go near that house, she's mean. Or if your ball goes over that fence, like, forget it, it's gone. <laughs> you know, like, uh, the one old woman that lived on the beach, her name was Mrs. Roush, but we called her Mrs. Grouch because you couldn't do anything by her house without her coming out and yelling at you, you know? If we were, weren't home, you know, next door would take care of the, the shoveling sometimes, 
or vice versa. Like some of the older people, I would try to help them. We own a snowblower that we all chipped in for, and somebody runs down the block with it. I love to shovel snow. I just love it. I love to, my shovel is still out. I love to grab a shovel and come out when my kids were little, up until, even after the eight bypasses, I still, and then I, everyone would say, don't do it, stop. And I said, you know what, maybe they're right. Maybe I shouldn't be doing it. And my cardiologist said, no, don't do it. But I still do. We have chipped in to get a snowblower, you know? So there are people down the end of the block where the snowblower is that do get it done by one of the people who live on the block and they make sure that they come down the block. I've yet to see it come down this end of the block, but she just said that they did do us. Luckily, we have grandkids and they help us. And Linda loves to do it. I love to shovel. She's a big snow remover person. That's just second nature, you know what I mean? I had the snow plow going, we had the blizzards back, you know, we haven't had blizzards in a while, so I didn't have to pull the plow out. But I would start here, work my way all the way down to the beach, ran across and worked my way all the way back with the snow plow. This is before I pulled the, bob, the bobcat, you know? And just, not everybody could plow. It's on your neck. And I've been Jeffrey's barber and haircutter for, how long? Couple of decades. Wow. I get a tomato, he gets a haircut. We figured out uh, to how to make uh, sun dried tomatoes in the oven. Oh, so you're going to give out sun dried tomatoes? No, no, no. No, no, no. no, no. It's become an in house thing. Yeah, it's going to be purely in house. We're going to oh, okay. just make as many as you want and put them in the refrigerator and keep forever. So it's only going to be some. Uh, some a little some, more selective be some very disappointed people. No, the, 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 the people who are on the A-list will still get theirs. Yeah, but the B-list people are going to really be... people won't have a prayer. Just yesterday, Mike and Julia in Florida, I hear something running. I go in their yard, their outside hose is blowing out. There's 600 gallons of water in their driveway over here. So I turned the water off, I called them, I said, I don't know what's going on, but you know, I just turned your outside hose off. Have somebody go in the house and check the basement. Make sure there's nothing else going on. But stuff like that, why, why not? You know, I'd want someone to do that for me. I grew up uh, on a driveway, a shared driveway. Occasionally things would happen. Misunderstandings would occur. And there developed very uh, fierce disputations. Some ugliness, some squirting of garden hoses at each other by adults. <laughs> I was hypersensitive to the dangers of shared driveways. Hey, old oh, Jeff. I, had, I oh, thought you yeah. to Vermont. A lot of people have heard horror stories about shared driveways and the problems that they cause. We're fortunate because not only of Jeffrey's generosity and his friendliness and his neighborliness, but our driveway, while it is a shared driveway, it's a two-lane shared driveway. We don't have to park front to end, front to back. We can park side by side as long as we leave room to open the doors to get out of your car. Well, we kind of have to stagger. You have we, to we stagger the cars. We can't park side by side or neither one of us will get a door open. But if we do it this way, it works. Jeffrey's parking is amazing. The skill involved is is very demanding. He gets within centimeters, centimeters of uh, distance between his building and his car, trying not to hit the building. Sometimes it goes wrong, but he gets an A plus for effort. The parking job is just uh, uh, phenomenal. Forty years late, I carved out. Uh, I changed the configuration of my lawn. So now you could put a truck in there, the first space, there's no problem. But back and forth over the years, passing each other and working it out, uh, required some thought and some skill, definitely. And in order to, to avoid problems, some natural generosity of spirit, which they have demonstrated unfailingly for whatever it is now, 
pushing 50 years. We, in 47 years, we have never had one word over that driveway. Not one. Not one. These were conservative, politically and socially conservative people who, it turned out, were extremely considerate and even courtly, I would say. If I were to script out who I wanted for a neighbor, it wouldn't be them, but it should have been. You couldn't have better people to share a driveway with. And I think if you went to any other two houses in this area that share a driveway, you won't have that same story. We have the shared driveway and there's a line down the middle. It brings negative bad thoughts of a neighbor when I first moved here. That line was such a division maker of them and us. We were two opposite ends of everything, everything in general. And I did everything to get along. Um, um, that's, my, that's my personality. I'm not an alpha dog. I'm, uh, I just want everybody to be pleased. I, I just couldn't do that for this woman. I'll say that. I'm a musician and she's a librarian. I'll say that much. <laughs> Take it for what it's worth. At the end of the day, neighbors and neighbors, and we interact differently. It all depends on the type of mindset that they're in or if they're imbibing or something of like that and how they would act, whether they're on or off, a couple of drinks or whatever the case may be. They called the police on me because I was playing my acoustic guitar in the afternoon. Now I know I said, I, suffice it to say, I didn't want to get into the whole story, but th these, were, these were some instances. And I'll go on record as saying her name was Lenore, but I had my own name for her, her and that was Ignore. It resolved itself when they moved. And maybe I was the impetus for them to put the house on the market. But, um, I know I can attest to the fact that living with my other neighbors now in total harmony, uh, I didn't think I, I was the, the bad impact on our, that former relationship. I'm a bit wary always about how I will be perceived and if I will be welcomed or kind of shunned. Um, and on this block, it's been amazing. Um, I, I just notice that people are of, of varied backgrounds, cultures, heritages, and I think that's beautiful. That's part of the mosaic, I guess, of, of any neighborhood and adds beauty to a neighborhood because everyone's individual culture um, adds to the beauty and the splendor of the neighborhood. And I have not been at all disappointed. Um, in fact, just the opposite. I've been so surprised by how welcome we've been. My mother uh, wanted to have instill in us some sort of connection to being Jewish. 
So she would want us to go to synagogue every Saturday. So as a child, when you went to school Monday through Friday, and Saturday was a great day to run around on the block with the other kids on the block, they weren't going to synagogue. But then, interestingly enough, they'd have their holidays. Like I remember once one of the, one of the children was like a particular Sunday. It was Easter or whatever it was. And no, you know, he can't be around. He's not going to be able to play. He has to. So it's like, well, what's that all about? The main big thing, I would say, and this just came to me now, and I remember this vividly, not so much today, but this was a very Christian country, I would say, growing up. And you only had so many television stations. And like a holiday like Christmas, for example, where all of the programming was people with trees and decorated and Santa Claus. And a lot of these were like uh, cartoons that were something you'd want to participate in. You know, you, you know, like there could be a child who might at some point want to deal with whether is Santa Claus real or not. But for me, it was like, wait a minute, Santa Claus doesn't exist at all, and this holiday is not our holiday. And as a child, you'd be like, well, everyone else, well, you know, why don't we celebrate? The, you know, again, these are these. This would be any child growing up in any country in the world where they're a different. You know, I'm sure there are many ethnicities, especially in this city, who come from different parts of the world where they're not Christian. And at that time, you, you know, you were absorbed by it. It was all over the radio, it was all over the TV, there was nothing to watch. And so you'd want to know why you weren't, uh, why, why that wasn't something that you celebrated. Right. When I moved on this block, there were a few Gentiles, and most of the people were Jewish. And now there are a few Jews, and it's all Gentile. That was the difference in the block. I don't think it makes a difference in how we relate to each other. Just that it was just very clear the changes in the neighborhood. Well, I think that the generations didn't, the, the generation of our children who grew up on the block, but they didn't come back. And I think many more of the kids, the, the Gentile kids come back more. Again, we all believe the same color. And to me, religion doesn't make a really big difference as long as you're a good human being. You know, some people believe in God. Some people believe in, in the moon, in the stars. Everybody <laughs> believes in something different. <laughs> I think these days on this block, it doesn't really create a layer amongst us, but everybody has their different levels of religion. Some people are more extreme than others. Some people believe harder than others. Some people don't believe at all. You don't want me to talk politics. Look, everybody has the right to their opinion on anything. And yours might be very different from mine, but why should that affect our friendship? You know, why? It, it shouldn't. It has nothing to do with anything. You can be, no matter who you are and what your background is, you're comfortable here. You know, t t to what a block means, uh, I think it's the quote from Belfast, the, the, the punchline is, no matter how far you go, you never forget where you came from. And I really think that that's, I know that that's so with Linda and I. I mean, really, it's like, you know, it's not like, it's not like a religion or, a, you know, a cult or anything, but we are like Brooklyn kids. I mean, I, I'm really speaking for myself. I could see that alleyway, and I know what it was to me and what, how it formed me in terms of, I'm not a tough guy, but you get to be a little bit tough. You get to learn who you could deal with. You learn that there are some people... <laughs> You have to confront, you know, again, not to fight and get your nose broken or anything, but it just never really leaves you. It's who you are, and you bring it here. And my family has business on her 29th. It was a Monday. It was a nice day. It, it, uh, crash actually woke me up because it shook the house this house shook the house and I looked out my third floor window 
and I saw just a huge column of smoke. It, from my direction, I thought that the school and the church were on fire. And this was now two or three months after 9-11, so everybody was skittish, like, is it gonna happen again? Uh, you know, what's going on? No one knows what's going on. And she paged me with 911. I said, oh, what's this? Because she's not the kind to call, you know, pick up a quart of milk on the way home. I came home, and since this was only a month or so after 9-11, they shut everything, all the bridges and everything. I jump in the car, my sister's with me, and we drive down Newport Avenue until we couldn't drive no more because the plane was laying across Newport Avenue. And several houses were on fire. I had no idea that one of the engines had landed at the shop and caused so much damage over there. And then somebody said to me, the gas station almost blew up because one of the engines hit. So I was, you know, this was like an hour or so after I'd been over at the other place. And I said, oh my God, I gotta run over there. And I run over there and sure enough, you know, there's all emergency vehicles there and they have a line ready to put the engine out if it starts going up again, but it just missed the building, skimmed the back of an oil truck. My father was walking out and it blew the plate glass windows and blew him behind his desk. So then when he came to, he realized that the oil truck was there and he had said he had to get that out of there because he knew that was going to be a problem because the fire was so close to that. You know, he's like, you know, you didn't really think, you just tried to deal with the situation at hand. And you know, we didn't even know what it was. And I walked down to the corner, the, you know, ground zero, you know, if you will. And you see there's basically an intact wing of the plane was, you know, across the street. The smoke was out. It was just smoking and there was everybody in hazmat suits climbing over the rubble like little bees, you know, looking for either, you know, survivors and stuff and so on and so forth. It was, and I didn't know that the destruction around the corner because I'm dealing with this, he, he told me, you know. And he said right away, I thought it was like a terrorist thing, you know, like a the thing, yeah. you know, with 9-11 and this came off the plane in the air. Like, so it wasn't just a plane crash because it would have crashed whole, yeah. you know. Prior to Hurricane Sandy, it was a Hurricane Irene that we were prepared. We battened down the hatches and so forth. And Hurricane Irene here, we ended up getting two to three inches of water. I got to the point where we got so scared that we, I parked all my cars. I have eight cars and I parked them in Kings Plaza parking lot and it was a big deal. After we noticed that it was nothing, my neighbor across the street, Jimmy, we ended up having a pool party for two days <laughs> celebrating that uh, we had no problems. So when Hurricane Sandy came about, we were already engraved with, ah, it's bullshit. Nothing's going to happen. When Storm Irene came, which was a year prior to Sandy, a year or two, I'm trying to remember, I think it was a year prior, uh, they made so much of it. That's what made our decision to stay here for Sandy because if we could get through Irene, we could get through Sandy. Well, I was proven wrong. We almost lost our lives because of Sandy. It was a stupid decision on our part to stay here. At that point, you know, I don't like to rehash it. You know, sometimes it clicks into my head because you know, a lot of people have PTSD from that, you know, and uh, it definitely affected everybody. I don't care who you are. You could be the wealthiest guy or the poor person on the street. Everybody was affected because we we're entirely underwater. Hurricane Tandy. Right, my children probably to this day are still upset with me. They lived in Bay Ridge at the time and they kept saying, Mom, you've got to go, you've got to go. And I said, Listen, I'm in so much pain, I can't go anywhere. I was waiting for a hip. We were on the phone with Nora, who was standing on her porch watching the waves crash over the beach houses, and she was narrating them to us. I stayed here. I never left. Me and one of my sons stayed here throughout the whole thing. We were all here the night of Sandy. Well, Sandy was uh, something that we will never forget for the rest of our lives. They called it the 100-year storm, and I hope we never see another one. We have things that we do consciously, so you can say, you know, we keep our space or whatever, but there's also the subliminal aspect to it, that when under duress, and Sandy certainly was 
to rest, in, in, you know, at, at, at high magnitude. Yeah. I think people's better natures really will demonstrate it. And then we start, I started seeing like kitchen appliances come down mm -hmm. the street. And I said, what is that? Oh, and the ca a kayak. A kayak. kayak ended up right on the front steps. So like, I, 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 I ran out. I, I grabbed the kayak mm -hmm. and I tied it to the rail. I said, well, if we have to go, yeah. this will be our, our, our way out, you know? Yeah. Broke. The door led to the beach. When the door broke from the wall, everything started crashing in on the first floor. And I couldn't hold the water back. As I left the front door of the house on the second floor, a wave hit me and it knocked me against my banister, which thank God it held me. My glasses fell off, which I lost. Um, I walked down the stairs. As soon as I got to the street, which was waist deep, a wave took me, took me underneath the water and they pulled me out of the water on front of Georgia Vivian's. The people there pulled me out. By that time, I thought when the wave took me down below, there was so much debris in the water. The dune fences, the concrete from the wall was hitting me. So when I get out, I was bleeding. When I was underneath the water, I said, oh, I bought it tonight. Meaning that I wasn't going to make it. But thank God, that was a, a wake-up call that nothing is more important than your life. My basement had seven feet of water. So I had to dive into seven feet of water, swim, and try to pry this drain open so the water could start draining. And I managed to do that, but it couldn't drain fast enough because what happened was from the wind, the back door got ripped open. It actually cracked. Mm, terrible. I never know that. So scared. A lot of damage in the basement. Are you afraid that it might happen again? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so scared. Really? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. There was a man across the street that had a generator. You know, it was, I, I sort of saw it. And I know my phone was dying. You know, that was, that was like a lifeline, your phone. And I asked him if I could charge it, and he did. The interesting thing is the next day there was water still rushing down the street and in the stream was a bottle of a Quavazier or one of these fancy bottles of whiskey and I just picked it up and I gave it to him. You know, it was just, it was that kind of thing. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to drink this. It just the kindness of others came through, you know. I know I could have walked off my front step into the water. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as, as I got off the, the doorstep, the first step was ankle deep. I could have dove and had no problem, you know, because when I waded out to the bottom of the steps, I was chest deep. And water was squirting through the, through the, the gaps the as the door the was, door. you know, the, the, the door in the alley. And we wanted to jam something, wedge something in a way so it didn't blow open. But in the uh, uh, confusion and commotion, to push the door closed, my daughter put her hand on the glass. It's the original glass. It's like an eighth of an inch thick. Like four panes of glass. Divided Went by. through it and sliced open her forearm. It's that, like, that was it. After that, oh, it crap. was like what everybody upstairs. There's no, you can't go anywhere. Well, I had a first aid kit. You know, we just wrapped kit. it in gauze and everything. And then the thing is, you know, whatever, whatever you believe in, God, fate, karma, not your time, whatever, by the grace of God, if you will. Didn't cut any main cables. Yep. Uh, she has a nice, which is kind of faded now, uh, like two and a half inch, three inch scar on the inside of a thing, which doesn't bother. I used to joke, oh, you could get a tattoo of a hurricane or something <laughs> on it, and, you know, like that. But it, it, it's gone away. And as you, you know, may realize being from the neighborhood, the kicker, the, the punchline, shall we say, is the same thing happened to a lady that lived on 124th Street, except she did hit main cables and bled out in front of her family. So for us, that's uh, by a quarter inch where our lives saved versus ruined. Yeah. Do we always second guess ourselves for staying? Uh, 
you know, there's there's no way of of telling, and that's one reason we never complain about what happened to us. We lost the basement. We lost a lot of stuff around. We lost the car, so on and so forth. We didn't use my daughter. We know people, as you know, that literally swam out of their burning houses and were left with nothing but a brick porch and a chimney. It was all they had left. So, as far as uh, you know, as far as things go in the great balance, you know, the scales, we don't bitch. During Sandy, we were all in this together. And everybody gave to what we could to one another. If it was um, a generator, I could get you a generator, or um, I could get you a hot water heater. Everybody needed something. And so whatever we could give to one another, we did. Now, once you were done with something, you, you let whoever used it. It was like feast of famine, you know? Everybody needed a lot of help. And Everybody just stuck together and helped. Like, even across the street, Jimmy Quigley came out. He was like the block leader. Came, he was the go-to guy. You, you needed anything. He calmed your nerves down. I thought, like, the end was they just... I thought everything was gone, and I thought it was all going to be gone. But he just reinforced it's going to be okay, and he really just stepped up to the plate, you know. After Sandy, they developed a kind of a disaster tourism. People walking up and down the beach, looking at the damage. The day after Sandy, the day of, I, I was here. I stayed the night, would have come about 7.30 p.m. My wife and kids went to Bay Ridge where they would be safe. My son had an apartment there. I stayed the night, waking up the next morning after feeling the house shake through the entire night, waking up the next morning and seeing rooftops outside my, on my lawn and things of that nature. Um, I got, I walked out that morning and I walked the neighborhood. I walked to 129th Street, which was still uh, burning embers and, you know, and people on the street crying and holding each other. I walked to the beach where I saw every first house along the beach front look like a dollhouse where you have the open front and you can put the f pieces of furniture in the way you want to decorate it. Um, after Sandy, there was countless stories of people helping. You know, I remember like Lori and Jimmy Quigley, I didn't really know them too well because my, my parents were still living here, but you know, the block was a mess. And all we were trying to do was get the gas turned back on um, so we could have hot water. And we know like heat wasn't really gonna happen, but we, at least we could run the hot water heaters to take a hot shower. And the guy said, the two houses at the beach are destroyed. We have to cap those gas lines. But we also have to go into every house and make sure that the gas is shut off. So I was like, oh, man. I was like, what are we going to do? And I was like, well, I, I know most of the people. I can call them. If they'll give me permission to go in the house, I'll, I'll shut the gas off to all the houses. You know, I, I, in the fire department, you do that regularly when there's a gas leak. She was like, I'll get on. Lori said, I'll get on my phone, too. And me and her, as her husband was calling, we went into the houses and we just shut the gas in the main gas to like six houses on this block, whoever wasn't home, and like four houses on that side. And it got done that day by everybody, you know, doing what they could to do it. I drove up and, you know, I remember seeing everybody on the block. Everybody was trying to dig out and try to get some type of, you know, figure out what they're doing and try to get some sanity of what happened to them. And everyone's just trying to dig out. Every, every, who's helping this one? Who's helping that one? And I'm saying to myself, you know, everyone's working so hard. I'm like, there's no food. There's nowhere, no, no, nowhere, no, not, nothing to get to, for them to drink or eat. So I said to myself, okay, got back in my truck, drove all the way to Brooklyn, called the head. Uh, I went to a deli and I ordered like um, about 20 something heroes, just piled everything back in my truck and then just said, let, let me come here and feed the neighborhood while we're all working, trying to, you know, dig ourselves out and try to get back to find some normalcy of what happened to us. So, and that was it. I had one very vivid experience. The uh, electricity and the, and the heat was off. So I found, when I walked through the house, I had this intuition that it was dead. Uh, when we get, well, the next time I came and the heat was on and the electricity was on, 
it felt to me like it had come alive. It was a, a very kind of a visceral sensation. It wasn't a, you know, an intellectual formulation or anything. There's one family on this block that really came to my rescue, the Raiders. The Raiders immensely helped me get my important stuff out of the home. Not even my family helped me. I don't know how to say this, but it's, it's remarkable what a wonderful human being Tommy is, how much he did for us. He pulled some of my wife's medical records and many other things, you know, some of my clothes. You know, and even after the storm, I, whatever, I was helping Dino out, but that's, they had nothing. You know, they lost totally everything. Mm -hmm. Where a lot of us lost a lot, but not compared to what they had lost. Actually, one of the beams from his house is what went through my basement window, and that's where my house filled up. Oh, yeah, beam, beam from, his and from his house went flying down the block. A neighbor, Jimmy, south of me here, that owned a plumbing supply company. He had one of his trucks come down here that day after, when everybody still had water in their basements and all, and he was handing out the bilge pumps, the, the, the hoses. He had generators to run so people could plug in from one neighbor to the next. Coming back here, uh to try to clean up the, the hard mess Yeah, just mess about that every day we were back. After one month, I smelt like uh, chlorine with uh, trying to just mop and clean. And very, very slowly it came back with the help of uh, New York City Department of Sanitation and uh, neighbors again helping one another. But the, the, block, they were, the block was sad, though. It was very sad to come down the block though everyone kind of was, I think, helped each other a lot more. Yeah. I think they made everyone maybe superficially closer. I don't know. They became more of a community. You were really more, that's what it seemed like. And some people were, some people were hurt financially, I think. And at least one guy I know got knocked down trying to run down the block with the ocean surging behind him. And sometimes tragedy brings strength. It, um... It, it strengthens bonds and makes neighbors uh, better and stronger neighbors. Actually, Sandy's brought us so much closer together and just uh, it makes you want re realize what's important. The expression is you grow up with sand between your toes. And what you're referring to in terms of the trade-off of being here and there being an element of fear or Mother Nature getting the best of us. I think we've gotten to be a little tough here because the year before Sandy, there was a, a hurricane. And then Sandy came, and as bad as it was, and it was bad, you know, we survived it. And now I think we've mitigated it. We, in terms of our own houses, we've done things that, oh, if this happens again, now I got shutters, or now I've graded my, you know, my cement. I've made a dry well in the backyard. So we, we feel, and maybe falsely so, that we have found a way to combat the next one. Plus the fact, we have to say that the government, you know, uh, the Corps of Army Engineers, has now built jetties, and they're going to build dunes, and they have built walls. So we feel, and again, <laughs> I hope we're not wrong, but they, you know, we feel that much attention is being paid. What I find out about my neighbors, it seems in times of tremendous, I mean, questioning of what people are made of, I, I found out that next day. Honestly, if the ocean, in my opinion, decides to rebel, I, I don't think no man stopping. I don't think man can stop it. We we do what we can do. Right. It's a nice, happy environment here. We go out of our way for each other. But people are people. It's it's human nature to be kind when there's a tragedy and then it goes back to the same old what we went through. You We're know, back to normal like 
ah, don't do this, or do this, or, you know, back to the same old stupid stuff. Yeah. Say hello, don't say hello. Unless somebody's paying my mortgage, I worry, I'll worry <laughs> about what they think of me. If you're not paying my mortgage, no, no worries, no big deal. Well, moving from this block was the saddest day of our lives, I have to tell you, because I think my kids still to today talk about this block. And I kid you not, they keep saying, Ma, I really want to go back to the house on 138, the red house. They call it the red house. I, I hope they do something wonderful with it. It's a great house, but we couldn't put, we couldn't put the work into it. We didn't have the energy, the, uh, the resources, the time. Um, I really wish, I, I do wish that it comes out to be beautiful. They have four little girls. It's like it's such a way to revitalize life. It's such a great thing to go from, you know, flip generations. It's just a house. It's more than a house. <laughs> the house keeps the rain out and the snow and the winds and a home keeps the love in. See the goosebumps here? There is no, there is no negativity. The reality at the end of the world is if negative expands tenfold, where positive takes its time. If you keep everything positive and even keel, everything's going to be fine. Kumbaya, call it whatever you want. Harmonious cohabitation on the block. This is a unique place. You have a major metropolitan area that's a subway ride or now even a ferry ride away. And yet you can come here and it's, it's gone. I mean, you're, you know, you by the beach, you're by the ocean, it's quiet. You know, now it's, it's, it goes through phases. You know, the kids grow up, people sell their homes, and then another batch of kids come. And, you know, you see it's like a revolving door. So the houses here turn over basically why? Because people are getting too old to keep them, and they turn them over to either their children or, you know, they just sell them and go to live in condos or nursing homes or whatever, wherever life <laughs> takes them. Yeah, wherever the next step is, but uh, hopefully not for me, but, <laughs> you know. You, you never lose that, the way you grew up. But there is a very strong kinship between the people that grew up here. No matter where we come from, it should always be like that. Every neighborhood should be like that. Rich, poor, indifferent, you know, everyone should be pulling together to help each other. So I just think it's a microcosm of the world. And uh, if you go further, you can go into nature, and there are ant colonies and termite colonies, and I think we all need one another. You can't, you know, no man is an island or woman. No man or woman is an island. And um, you just have to learn that it's important that this crapshoot, you know, doesn't end up with snake eyes. You know, you just have to make sure, you know, that you're at the table and you're, I like you're, that. And you're winning. I like and, and you win every day. You all win. You all win. So you let things go. I, I found in my time, when you deal with people, neighbors, friends, family, otherwise, you can't hold on to the negativity in the past. Because if you live your life in the past, your future's history for any growth that you could have with anybody. And the amount of change over the years, how people move out and move in, and some of the people who moved in have moved out, and newer people move in. So it's... It will be a nice reflection of how the block has changed over the years. It's almost like a newspaper. You know, you, you find out every day how this one's doing, how that one's doing. There have been births, there have been deaths. It's, um, you know, there's a play called Our Town. It's sort of that. It's just this constant, like the waves the constant ebb and flow you know, of life, of a block. Everybody needs their own space. One thing, everybody knows each other's pants size, but other than that...
streets all a buzz It's seven in the morn The mockingbird mocks the ocean's roar The kids back to school in uniforms Bathing suits and flip-flops is their norm Doors open and close to just so concise The postman comes, he always is right The roof grows strong, the driveway rules Burrowing deep, sand between our toes That Halloween Sandy, she raged into town her vicious broom swirled round and round Wailing and flailing like a tumbling gator We traded hot dogs for generators Madden Defarge pierced through pleated shades Noting who masks up as COVID faith Back in the day we shared party lines a block soon chat has become sublime Shared driveways, they taunt the rule Over Rockways Bridge, heave a sigh, it's cool Our neighbors took on the full shock But we came together to build back our block We came back together to build back our block